Welcome to the first day of the Open Source Summit in Vienna. Uh, we're pretty much at the end of the day now. I hope you had some fantastic talks so far. My name is Philip Nikolic. I'm working at ISOVALENT, uh, the creators of Cilium and eBPF, which is now part of Cisco. And today I want to demystify CRI in this talk. And we're going to do this by actually writing a CRI from scratch. Now, to start out with certain things, who here has heard before of containers? Just a show of fans. And hopefully I'll see every single hand up because it's container con. So please leave them up there. We're, we're going to make a quick game out of it. So leave, leave the hands up there. Come on, everybody. Yeah, amazing. Good. So here's a couple of topics, all right? Uh, leave your hand up uh, if you've heard of containers. And leave your hand up if, you've know, if you know what CRI is. OK? Leave your hand up if you know what gRPC is. Leave your hand up if you know what Linux namespaces are. Leave your hand up if you know what a CNI is. OK, and leave your hand up if you've ever written code in order to make your own containers. OK, basically no hands left anymore. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and here's the funny thing about this talk. Uh, these are all requirements in order to do what we want to do today here. And as you saw, the number of hands drastically decreased, all right? So this is going to be a very challenging uh, talk, uh, both for me as well as for you. So we're going to speed walk through some of these topics here right now in order to give you an essential idea of what they are and how it is being used. So we're going to start out simple by talking about CRI and container runtime. So what is CRI? CRI stands for Container Runtime Interface. The two logos that you see here are uh, popular implementations of a CRI, okay? They are so-called container runtimes. They're not container runtime interfaces. They're container runtimes that implement the interface. If this didn't confuse you enough yet uh, in terms of the wording, here is a graphic that is supposed to explain a bit better what I mean by this. So <clears throat> let's imagine you have a user. That user wants to create a pod. All right, it's sending a pod manifest over to the Cube API server. At a certain point, the scheduler will know to which node uh, that pod shall be assigned to, and then the API server will reach out to the kubelet on that specific node. The kubelet will then talk to the CRI and say, hey, here's a job for you. Please create uh, what is necessary in order to have this pod up and running. The CRI that you saw here is actually called the container runtime. Um, it is just a thing in the community that people like to use abbreviations. And so instead of using the correct term, they're using the term CRI in order to describe a container runtime. Uh, what is actually the, the CRI is that part in the middle, which is the communication aspect between the kubelet and the container runtime. So actually speaking, the CRI is simply how these two applications are communicating with each other. All right, And that communication is happening via gRPC. So to simplify things though, and since everybody uses the term, we're simply gonna call this the CRI like everybody else does. Uh, so the CRI's job is to create a container. Fair enough, simple, right? So this is what we're gonna focus on in this talk. So summarize CRI container runtime, what's the difference? CRI is the API between the kubelet and container runtime. And this is part of the Kubernetes repository, all right? You can find this if you go into the Kubernetes repository in staging, source, kds.io, CRI API. You'll see there exactly uh, what needs to be implemented in order to be able to say you are CRI compliant. And the container runtime is the software responsible for managing containers. And it receives its tasks from kubelet by implementing CRI, and this is how the communication happens. So let's talk about gRPC here. And I'm going to keep it very simple uh, since there's a lot of technologies that we need to cover here. So usually what people think about um, when we say an API is they think about a REST API, right? It's very simple. You have a client, you have a server. The client reaches out to the server. And it's usually going to send uh, some data over. So it's going to be an HTTP POST request onto slash users, for example and you will go ahead and send some JSON alongside it, right? The JSON may be something like username, OSS rocks, and location Vienna, 
So what you would now expect to happen is the server gets the JSON, and since it's a post, it means it needs to create something, so it's going to create that new user. Um, simple enough. Well, gRPC is essentially an API as well, right? But it just works a bit different. Um, it is still using HTTP, um, although new versions of it. And I take some artistic freedom here. Uh, it is not entirely accurate, but in essence, what is happening is the following. Uh, you're using a post method and you're supplying data with it. However, that data is not going to be in form of a JSON like you're used to. It's going to be in a binary format, all right? Which basically means you're omitting all of these white spaces, all columns, all commas, all brackets, and so on. Which means you have less data that you need to put over the wire, which means things are faster. That's the essential idea behind gRPC, right? So since you go ahead and do this, it as well doesn't really matter whether you're sending data to slash users, to uh, slash methods, to slash articles, it doesn't matter. What you're doing instead is you're actually calling a function. Now, the liberty aspect that I mentioned is basically that this function that you would see here, like create users, would actually be part of the payload, all right? But uh, for simplicity reasons, I simply chose to put it up there in order to give you an idea of how things work. So this gRPC, it's just another way of making an API work, it's highly efficient, and it's not using plain text, it's using a binary format. Which as well means that both client and server need to understand what this sequence of zeros and ones mean, all right? So we'll have to know, is this supposed to be an integer? What is that supposed to be? Is it a string, is it an integer, is it a float, and so on. So client and server need somehow to understand what is being sent. And the way how this is done is by using a so-called protofile, okay? So a protofile is essentially defining the underlying API, how it's going to look. This is the exact uh, proto-API of the CRI, all right? You can find it, um, you can find it in the Kubernetes group on GitHub. There is a project called uh, CRI-API, and then just go there, package APIs, runtime v1, API proto. Um, obviously, this only a snippet of it, but it's going to be, so to speak, the most important part for this talk. So what you can see here in line two is there is a service uh, defined called runtime service. This will essentially be translated into our code later on. There's as well other things in there. Uh, the important aspects are highlighted here. So for now, let's just think about the runtime service, the version, and the version response. And you can as well see in line three, it says you have to return a version response. So in line three, it says there is an RPC, which basically means a function that can be called, called version. When you call version, you will have to return a version response. In line 13, you can see how that version is response being structured. So you need to uh, supply back a version uh, in form of string, a runtime name, a runtime version, and a runtime API version, right? And so we basically need to parse this protofile and we need to now write code that works with it. And how that looks is the following way. So what we have here is some Go code. And what I want to point out here is you do not have to write these things in Go whatsoever. Oftentimes people come up with the idea, oh, containers, Kubernetes, everything must be written in Go. That's actually not the case. Uh, as long as your uh, favorite language supports gRPC, you can do this in any language you want. I simply chose Go for simplicity reasons here. So when we look at this Go code, uh, it is implementing lots of the things that we saw in the previous proto part, right? We have here uh, in line two, we have a type, the mystifying CRI, it's a struct. Doesn't really matter what that is in case you're not familiar with Go, just think of it as an object. And then we have a runtime service server implemented, which is well similar to what we saw before with the service being defined. And then in line seven, we have a function being defined called version, and the function is returning a version response, as we can see in line eight. So far, so simple, right? So this is essentially all we need to know about gRPC. Now, let's talk a bit about Linux namespaces. What are Linux namespaces? Well. There's a bunch of different Linux namespaces, okay? Um, we're not going to cover all of them, just going to give you a, a simple explanation of what they are by uh, giving an example with the PID namespace, and later on we'll talk as well about the network namespace, all the others we can forget about for now. 
So if you understand what namespaces are, essentially think of them as isolations, okay? The Linux kernel uh, wants you to be able to isolate certain things. Um, now, isolation needs to be really used in a careful approach here. Uh, the Linux kernel uses the word isolation in its documentation. However, it's not as much isolated as you may um, know it from virtual machines, for example. However, it does give you some sort of isolation. And so what it means is you create a namespace of any form and you can now do things inside of that namespace without it affecting things outside of that namespace. Simple enough, right? So if you have two PID namespace like here, uh, it means that process A and process B are in the same PID namespace. So if you were to go ahead and do a PS inside of the top uh, PID namespace, you will see that it will list you process A and process B. Make sense? Uh, with the bottom one, it would list process X and process Y, but it wouldn't list the other ones because they're isolated. So this as well means you cannot really interact with them. And so you can basically start things and you can destroy things in your own namespace without it affecting other things. If this sounds familiar to you, well, this is exactly the technology that containers use, right? So if you go into a container, you do a PS, you'll see exactly this. You won't see the processes uh, that are on your host because they are in a different namespace. So what you can as well do now is you can interact with other process within that namespace. So process A could go ahead and kill process B if it wanted to, and if it had enough permissions, obviously. But you wouldn't be able to do the same thing to another namespace. Simple enough. Now, let's get back to our actual example. So our actual example here uh, is that somebody wants to create a pod, and so Kubelet tells our uh, uh, CRI, hey, we want a pod. And so the CRI's job is now to do that pod. And so what it is going to do first is it's going to create a so-called network namespace. And that network namespace is very important. Uh, it is oftentimes as well referred to as a sandbox, okay? It is essentially a container of its own. It's using the same principle as we had before with PID, but just this time with network, which means you can do network configuration in there, uh, but it won't affect network configuration outside of that namespace. And so after it created that network namespace, then and only then it will actually go ahead and create the container that you requested it to do, all right? So it is always, uh, in terms of pod, it is always at a minimum going to create two containers. The one being the sandbox container and then the actual container that you want it to. And that container is then going to use the network namespace of the sandbox. So CNI, um, just quickly about CNI, you can see as well it's strike three because we're not going to cover anything related to networking. Um, the reason why is usually the flow how it works is CRI creates the net, uh, network namespace and then it calls upon a CNI. And the CNI is supposed to do some kind of network configuration. It doesn't really matter what it is. In case you want to know what the CNI does, uh, I have another repository on this and gave another talk earlier today on this. So you can look up in detail exactly what it does. It's written like a blog post. So feel free to check it out in case you're here for networking stuff. We're not really going to cover that in much detail. All right, so uh, back to what we are going to cover. CRI creates network namespace, and that's it for now. All right, so and now we're getting to the code part of things. So I know I was speaking quite fast, but essentially we're getting there now. I have a couple of snippets for you here, and I posted them on the slides here because honestly it would take about 200 lines of code uh, to write this here. I would do 50 typos, we would all be confused, we would all have to debug it together, and it would just be a more hilarious session for sure, but a less productive one, all right? So I put the essential snippets on slides beforehand, and we'll just go through them. It is not all the code uh, that's necessary, like you will see me not having put in some uh, error handling and so on, these kind of things and some other necessary functions, but I will at least tell you the important things that are, uh, that are useful for you to know about. And what we're gonna start with first is the version one. Uh, we've already seen this before, 
And the reason why it is important is essentially because the kubelet, when it starts, it is going to trigger a couple of functions. And so if we do not implement those functions, the kubelet will crash, right? So we have to first figure out what kubelet is gonna do, which functions it uh, requires during startup time, and then we're implementing them. Version is just one of them. There's other ones as well, but version is one of them. So we have to implement it. Um, fair enough, we're just gonna implement it and we're gonna return uh, in line two, we're gonna return a version response as defined by the protofile that we saw earlier. Now let's go ahead and talk about something that Container Runtime now actually does, some useful stuff, right? So we're gonna pull an image. Uh, whenever you need to create a pod, you will have to pull an image. Makes sense, right? There will be a registry, you download it. Now for those not really familiar with what images are, honestly, the best way to think about them is tarballs, right? Have you ever had a tar, dot tar, or dot zip somewhere, download it? That's pretty much how images are built on and they have multiple layers. The details aren't really that important to us. However, what you need to understand is you will download that image which is basically in a compressed file format, and later on, we will have to unpack it. Okay, that's the important gist of it. So in line three, what you can see here is we're gonna do download image, which is a function just for uh, the sake of speed that I've omitted from this talk. Uh, you can check the source code later on how exactly that one is implemented, but it's gonna download something, store it on the file system. So next things. now. Uh, there is an image, right? So now that we have an image, we want to do certain things. What we want to do is now create this sandbox, right? As I mentioned beforehand, in order to create the network namespace, it is oftentimes as well referred to as a sandbox. This is exactly what this means. So we have here in uh, line one, a function called run pod sandbox. And here, we're gonna first assign a sandbox ID, right? These things need to be unique. We do not want you, if uh, you were to create multiple pods, we do not want them to use the exact same sandbox because then they would share the network, which is not really nice, right? So we want one sandbox per pod. So we're gonna create a unique sandbox ID and I simply chose to give it uh, the following structure. We're gonna give it the namespace minus the name of the pod. Simple enough. So it's gonna be unique now. And then we're gonna name it minus sandbox. That's line two. Now in line four, what we're going to do now is we're going to unpack the image. Uh, the sandbox is using a special image. It's called the pause image. The pause image we would previously download, right? It would be in this compressed format that I mentioned. And now we would have to unpack it, which basically means similar like with a .tar, uh, .zip and so on we'll just expand it so that there is all the files in there. And then we'll have the actual file system uh, that the image uses. So we're unpacking that. Then lines seven to 11, uh, we're loading and modifying the OCI spec, which is basically just a JSON configuration that is later on used in order to start the container. So what we're doing here is uh, there is this config.json because we unpacked it we're now loading it and uh, we are going in line 10, going to set process.terminal to false. This is just something we have to do in order to be able to uh, make it run in the background because otherwise it would like to show us all the output that it produces. And then in lines 13 to 15, we're just executing a command and we're executing run C. Run C is a very low level API for creating and managing containers, okay? Um, what Run-C needs in order to do these things is it needs to be pointed, it needs to be pointed to the unpacked image where there it will look for a config.json and some other files, and then according to that, it is going to start the container. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So with this uh, unpacking, loading, and running, we now created our own container. That container is now gonna uh, be useful for us because this is the network namespace I referred to earlier on. And now we're just gonna store some information uh, that we can later on retrieve. And then in line 20, we have to return a statement 
and we have to return that statement to the kubelet and we're gonna tell it hey everything went right there is no error nothing and here is the id of the sandbox that i just created all right so what's next now we've created the network namespace but now we want to go ahead and create the container within that network namespace so similar things again uh, we will first have to start with getting the sandbox PID, the pros ID of the sandbox. Uh, the sandbox is, as mentioned, a special image. All it's doing is basically sleeping. It's not doing anything. It just exists until somebody kills it. It's not doing anything else. Uh, however, even that sleeping uh, has a PID. And the reason why we want to get this PID is because once you have a process ID, you can very easily from there go on and extract the network namespace, all right? So we first need to find the PID. We're gonna do this by, uh, again, asking run C for help. If we do in line five, run C state, and give it the uh, sandbox ID that we previously created, uh, it's going to give us a JSON as an output. And now in line uh, seven, to, in line seven to 11, what we're actually doing is we're simply telling uh, it to find the PID in that JSON. That's it. And then we have the PID. Uh, in line 12, we are now going to check the uh, network namespace path. So we know in slash proc, slash proc has a list of all the available process on uh, the system. And then we're going to put in slash proc slash PID in there. And then namespace net. This is how we reference the network namespace. Now we again go ahead and modify the config.json similar to what we did previously. We did some unpacking beforehand in order to be able to have access to that config.json. And now we are going to in line 17, uh, add or replace the Linux namespace. And we're going now to replace the network namespace with the network namespace of the sandbox that we just created, that we just figured out. Then we're going to store that information and in line uh, 21, 22, again, run C run is going to run that container for us. And it's going to make sure that it shares the exact same namespace as uh, the sandbox. Then we're storing some information in line 24 and in 25, again, we're responding to Kubelet, hey, we created this container with the following ID. So what then? Uh, then we will have a main function in there where we need to trigger all of that. So the way how the communication actually happens is not through uh, through TCP sockets, okay? It is actually happening through Unix sockets. So in line two, we're essentially doing exactly this. The CRI simply defines that's how it's supposed to work, so we'll do that. In line two, we do net.listen, which means we're creating a Unix socket, which now means uh, the uh, container runtime implementation that we're having here, as well as kubelet, are uh, going to bind that specific socket, and they're going to be able to communicate over that socket. This is exactly how they share information with each other. Then we're going to initialize uh, the runtime service uh, that we defined, which was the struct earlier on. And then uh, from line 15 onwards, what we're now going to do is we're going to say grpc server dot new server, right? So this is how we start a grpc server. And then we're going to register uh, those couple of services that we saw in the protofile. And then we're doing grpc server dot serve on that specific uh, listening socket. And with this, we have a functioning runtime. Well, I may say functioning, but it's really the worst kind of things because we didn't really manage what happens if we need to delete something, what happens if something is broken. We don't really have any of that. However, it will work. It will actually work. So if we were to do a kubectl run in order to create a pod, such as an HTTPD pod, we're going to do this, image is HTTPD, and then we do a kubectl get pods. It will be in status container creating, obviously. And so after some time, when we check the, uh, with describe the pod, we'll see that there will be a bunch of events, the usual kinds that you expect. And so what it will say there is, first of all, it assigned the pod to a certain node, which is uh, what scheduler is doing. And then we're starting 
doing the actual work of things, right? It says here in line seven that there is a pulling image HTTPD. And you can see that it says from kubelet. Technically, this is not accurate. This is our container runtime that does things, right? But since we are reporting always back to kubelet, this is what uh, the API server thinks about. So basically kubelet is letting us do the work and gets all the honor for it, whatever. And yeah, so we're pulling the HTTPD image. You can see it takes some time. Then at some point it successfully pulled the HTTPD image, which is due to the pull image function that we implemented. Then after the pull image function uh, was successful, then it's going to start create the container, which is the create container function we implemented. And then we're reporting back that it started and running. And so in order to test all of this, uh, we can actually go on the node and do a run C list. Run C list is essentially going to list us all the containers that were created there, right? So if we grab for HTTPD, we can actually see two things here, right? One is the sandbox container, which is using the pass image, which is just sleeping just there so that we have a network namespace. And the other one is the HTTPD container, which is using that particular network namespace. And so what we can now do in order to test whether everything works or not, as you know, HTTPD is a web server, so we should be able to curl it. However, since we didn't do anything in regards to a CNI, we did not configure uh, networking whatsoever, we'll have to do it this way with NSEnter. Now, NSEnter is just going to do the following. It is going to take a command that you want to execute, in our case, it's curl localhost. So if you look at line seven, it's curl localhost that we want to execute, but we do not want to execute that on the host itself. We want to execute it inside of the network namespace. Inside of which network namespace? Inside of the network namespace with the PID 4011, which is uh, the process ID of the HTTPD container that you can see in line three. So we can see then that it works. And since both of them are using the exact same network namespace, we could do the exact same thing as well for the post container. Even though there is no curl installed there, this is a nice thing that uh, you can take with you. Uh, you can execute every command that you have, every executable that you have on your system. You can actually execute in any namespace you want if you do it like this. So you wouldn't necessarily need to install something inside of your image. This is a nice way to debug these things and we can see that it works. And with that, uh, we're coming to an end. Uh, thanks so much for attending. And just so you know, there is some um, uh, links here at the bottom. At the bottom left, you will find the uh, code for this talk, the mystifying CRI, which is uh, a bit more verbose, so to speak. It has a lot of more of lines in there, but some lines that it just didn't want to cover in this talk. And it has a lot of comments so that you can actually understand what's going on. And the other one on the bottom right is uh, the demystifying CNI aspect of things. In case you want to know more about networking and how CNI works, this is where you can find that information. And with that, thanks so much. If you have any questions, please let me know. All right, any questions? Uh, yes, there's a, I don't think there is a microphone. I'm sorry, yeah, please shout. Um, I know that's not really the point of the talk, but is there any real world reason for actually using a different CRI implementation than Cryo or ContainerD? Are there some weird edge cases mm -hmm. where it makes sense? Uh, good question. So I'll just repeat for the sake of having a microphone. Uh, so the question was, is there actually real world use cases where you would want to use another container runtime implementation, which is not container D or cryo? And the answer is yes. If you as well think about it, uh, and I think it was Kubernetes 1.25, uh, Docker was deprecated, right? So before that, we actually had Docker in there. So uh, in essence, there's a lot of different things that you can do. Some things that we see as well is that stuff like kata containers are coming up, right? Uh, for those of you not familiar with kata containers, uh, they are essentially creating, instead of just a pod sandbox, they are actually creating a very lightweight, but still fully functional VM. And so 
every pod that you're creating, if you use Kata containers, is then actually running inside of a VM. And so this would be another use case where you can go ahead and say, hey, I want to change up my CRI, I want to change up my container runtime. And since it is using uh, and adhering to the implementation of CRI, you can just switch them out. And so you could go ahead and have Kata container because maybe you want everything to be run in different VMs. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Any other questions? There is one over there. Uh, if you could shout, please. <laughs> Yes. Great question. So the question was uh, in particular about creating certain containers, such as uh, here, for example, in line 14, where it was using run C. And the question was, do all container implementations use run C? Is this something that really happens out there or not? Uh, and the answer, essentially, the quick answer is pretty much so, yeah. RunC is specifically designed as a low-level API in order to be used by other higher-level container implementations, such as Containerd, for example, uses it, Cryo uses it as well, okay? Uh, we could, however, not use it if we wanted to. If we really wanted to, we could do everything via syscalls in the kernel ourselves. This would now require a lot of unsharing and a lot of knowing how to handle process and so on. It's just a bit tedious, but if you want to, you could use it to answer your question. Yeah, most of them, over half of them at least, are using RunC usually. Yes. Another question, I think, over here. Pardon, I, I had troubles to understand the question. So what other things yeah. you can do? Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. So um, I'll repeat the question. In essence, it was hinting towards here, uh, line 7, 8, and 12, 13, where it said you could actually execute certain commands uh, that uh, you could execute certain commands that are installed on the system, but not within that particular namespace. So the question was, is there maybe other things that you could do in a similar fashion? Um, and the answer essentially is yes. So all that it takes is all that it takes is for you to have something on a system. Whatever you have on the system, you can then go ahead with the right set of tools, or if you were to do them yourself, if you know how, uh, you could go around and uh, tinkle with it. Uh, in case uh, you haven't seen it, like there is a couple of more examples. What exactly you could do in the demystifying CNI repository, where I'm going over how you can add, for example, some routes, uh, some interfaces, and so on, without having those specific tools installed inside of those containers. So yeah, there's a bunch of things you can do. All right. Um, yeah, at the very back, please shout loudly. Yeah, sure. so, uh, Mm -hmm. Great question. So uh, to repeat, um, here in line 14, as you can see, I'm using the command line interface of RunC to create the container. The question was, uh, why am I doing this, this via the command line? Couldn't I do it differently, for example, via an API, via the actual library, stuff like this? Uh, the answer is, yes, I could. Honest reason is, it's just simpler. This is one line, it fits better on a slide and so on. That's, that's the only reason here. Otherwise, I would have to do an import, I would have to create structs myself and so on. It would take 10 more slides just to explain this. So long story short, this is the way why I did it, the way I did. Uh, you could use an API if you want to as well. Sure, yeah. All right, uh, hopefully this all the questions because usually the longer it goes on, the more difficult the questions get. So yeah, last chance. Thanks so much.